Good evening. I'm Beth Keller from the Highland Park Public Library. On behalf of the 11 libraries hosting tonight's event, we would like to welcome you to Domestic Thriller Night, an evening with Megan Miranda and Sherry LaPena in conversation with Mary Kebica. Tonight's special program is presented by a partnership of your public libraries and is hosted by Algonquin Area Public Library, Arlington Heights Memorial Library, Deerfield Public Library, Glencoe Public Library, Highland Park Public Library, Lake Villa District Library, Mount Prospect Public Library, Niles Main District Library, Schaumburg Township District Library, Vernon Area Public Library, and Wilmette Public Library. Tonight, best-selling authors, Megan Miranda and Sherry LaPena will discuss their new books, Such a Quiet Place and Not a Happy Family. Congratulations to you both on your new books. We're so lucky to also be joined by best-selling suspense author, Mary Kabaka, who will be moderating tonight's conversation. Three independent bookstores are supporting this event with online book sales, Barbara's Bookstore in Vernon Hills, Bookbin in Northbrook, and The Bookstall in Winnetka. Links to purchase Megan Miranda's and Sherry LaPena's books can be found in the chat box on your screen. Signed book plates are available with each copy purchased while supplies last and purchases of the books will support these local bookstores. Following the, tonight's discussion, there'll be a question and answer session. You can submit your questions by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and typing in your questions. My colleague, Kate Cundiff from El Algonquin Area Public Library will moderate the question and answer session. Please note that as an attendee tonight, your microphone and camera are turned off. Closed captioning has been enabled. You can turn the closed captioning on or off by clicking on the live transcription or more icon at the bottom of your screen. I'd now like to turn it over to Annie Tillman from Lake Villa District Library to introduce our speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Megan Miranda is the New York Times bestselling psychological suspense author. Her books include All the Missing Girls, The Perfect Stranger, the Last House Guest and The Girl from the Widow Hills. The Last House Guest was a Reese Witherspoon book club pick. She has also written several books for young adults, including Come Find Me, Fragments of the Lost, and The Safest Lives. Such a Quiet Place was the number one July Library Reads pick nominated by librarians across the country and a July Indie Next pick. Ser Sherry LaPena is the internationally bestselling author of the thrillers The Couple Next Door, A Stranger in the House, an Unwanted Guest, Someone We Know, and The End of Her, which have all been New York Times and the Sunday Times of London bestsellers. Her books have been sold in 37 territories around the world. Not a Happy Family is her sixth thriller. Moderating the conversation this evening is Mary Kubica, the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of seven suspense novels, including The Good Girl, An Indie Next Pick, Pretty Baby, Don't You Cry, Every Last Lie, when the Lights Go Out, The Other Misses, and Local Woman Missing. Mary's novels have been translated into over 30 different languages. Without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Mary. Thank you very much, Annie and Beth, for the introduction. I'm so excited to be here virtually with you, Sherry and Megan. I wish that we could be in person and I could give you both a big hug and congratulate you on your fantastic <laughs> novels. But since we can't do that, I'm so excited that we can be here in this this format, um, chatting about your incredible books. Um, I just, I tore, well, I tore through them. <laughs> I, um, I couldn't put them down. Megan, I listened to yours and I was just totally riveted. And Sherry, it's just such a page turner. They're just both such wonderful whodunits. And um, everyone out there, if you haven't had a chance to read or listen to these books yet, I, I promise you that you are going to love them. Um, so I just, I wanted to dive right in. I have a whole bunch of questions for you. And then, you know, we're taking some questions in the Q&A too, if, if anybody has questions for Megan or Sherry. Um, but I wanted to start first with just a little bit about, spoiler free, um, about what the books are about. And I know that it's so tricky with this genre to talk about the books without giving too much away. So I'm going to let you do that. I'm not going to even attempt it. Um, so Megan, you want to start first and tell us a little bit about Such a Quiet Place? Yes, I would love to. And thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. This is such a treat for me to be chatting with two of my very favorite authors. So I'm so excited to be here. Um, my new book, Such a Quiet Place, is set in a really close-knit, idyllic neighborhood. 
the type of place where everyone believes they know everything about one another. And of course, this isn't true. So about a year and a half earlier, the foundation of this neighborhood was really shattered by a horrific crime that occurred. Um, two of the neighbors were found killed and the rest of the neighbors all worked together to piece together their doorbell cameras and their security footage to implicate one of their own. And they believe they found the killer and she was one of the neighbors named Ruby and all of their evidence led to her ultimate conviction. The book begins a year and a half later, just as her conviction is overturned and she comes right back into this neighborhood she once lived in, right back into this home she shared with her roommate Harper, who is the narrator of the story. And no one's really sure if she's innocent or guilty. They're not really sure what she's doing there. And there's really no good answer because if she is guilty, then there's a killer back in their neighborhood. And if she's truly innocent, then presumably a killer has been among them all along. And that's what kind of kicks off the story going forward. Uh, so good. Chills. <laughs> Sherry, you want to talk a little bit about your novel? Tell us a little bit about it. I just have to say that is such a great setup for your book. Like you. the idea of a killer coming back after having been let go is very good. Um, my new book is called Not a Happy Family. And it's about a wealthy couple, an older wealthy couple who have three adult children and it's a very dysfunctional family and somebody kills the parents, the older couple, one night after this Easter dinner with the adult children where nobody gets along. So once the murders are discovered by the cleaning lady, um, suspicion uh, turns to the three kids who are going to inherit millions and millions of dollars. So the book is really about trying to sort out which person might have killed these people. And um, yeah, all the, all the siblings and other people have secrets in their past that they want to keep hidden. And everyone is suspicious of everyone else. And you're really not clear who might have done it until the very end. So um, yeah, there's a whole um, thread in there about psychopathy and whether it's genetic and whether it's from nurturing or lack of. And um, I had a lot of fun writing all these psychopathic people, I have to say. <laughs> they are fun to write, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> they are, they're the best, yeah. <laughs> Um, and I mean, both of these, the, both of these setups are just fantastic. And I mean, the, the books just move so fast, you know, as a reader or a listener, you're just on the edge of your seat, just trying to figure out who did this. And one of the things that struck me about these two books is that the suspect pool is, it's pretty small. It's pretty um, contained, you know, um, Megan and yours, you know, we're in this neighborhood and with this, it's a, it's a tight knit neighborhood. Everybody seems to know everything about everybody, you know, and so they're, they're starting to look at one another suspiciously and wondering who they can and cannot trust. And Sherry and not happy, fam happy family, it's, it's the same, you know, we have these siblings and, and their spouses. And um, it's it's the same, you know, that that we're assuming that somebody in the family has done something to the parents, presumably. And you know, who again, who can we trust? Who is lying? And and it's it's so fantastic. And all of the different characters that we hear from, um, whether you know, first person if they're a narrator, or you know, just that we we get to know through the pages of these books, they're um, they're so distinct. Every single one of them really leaps off the page, and and they're memorable. Um, um, so Sherry, do you want to talk a little bit about, and then we're going to come back to you, Megan, but talk a little bit about what it was like developing these characters. Did you know from the beginning who the characters were going to be in this novel, or did, did that kind of, you know, grow as you wrote the novel? You know, I never really know um, much about my book when I begin. So I start with just a basic idea. Um, and I wanted to have a, a, a larger family this time rather than just the husband and wife. And I was interested in looking at adult siblings and um, parents and children relationships. And I knew I had to probably kill the parents and then have the kids wanting the money. So that's really all I started with. I didn't, the, the other thing I started with was I liked the idea of, you know, I, I read somewhere and I've read a few times that sometimes very successful self-made businessmen are actually psychopaths. And um, I've always found that a really interesting idea. And so I've got this character, Fred Merton, who was a self-made good billionaire, and he's got a lot of psychopathic traits. And then there's the question of, 
you know, does he hand down these psychopathic traits genetically to his, his kids? And, or is it this dysfunctional way they grow up um, that makes them the way they are? But um, so when I started, all I really knew was I was gonna have a murdered couple with a bunch of adult siblings who wanted money. And um, I thought the father, the patriarch of the family was probably going to be a psychopath. And other than that, I didn't know a thing. I didn't know how many kids or I didn't know anything with the wife. I didn't know how the murder was gonna happen. I didn't know who it was gonna be. I didn't know who the red herrings were gonna be. Um, so I just start and I go from there and I kind of figure it out as I go along. And I kind of develop my characters as I go along too. So I don't really have an idea who they are until I start writing them. So when I'm at the keyboard and I'm writing the page, that's when I start to learn who they are. And the more they do, the more I learn about them and they affect what happens and it just all kind of builds organically. So by the end of the book, I know them really well. We've been through a lot together and um, yeah, so, um, but for me, it's it's really, I don't know anything at the beginning. It's always sort of a, a leap of faith and a blank page and, you know, and the excitement of knowing I've got an idea that, that, that excites me. Um, so I'm, I'm, once I have an idea that I think has a lot of opportunities in it and something I can really get into, um, then I'm, I'm good to go. Yeah. Well, your, your characters were all just so genuine. And by the end of the book, I felt like I really knew them too. And I can't tell you how many times it, I went back and forth between, oh, this person did, no, this person did it, you know? And so you definitely kept me guessing throughout the book. Um, but they were just, like I said, they were really memorable, really genuine characters that I, I felt like I knew so well by the end of the book. So you just, you did a phenomenal job of capturing them. Um, what about you, Megan? How did you go about creating Harper and Ruby and all the others? So I loved hearing Sherry's answer because I feel like I have a similar process where I know very little when I begin and I feel like I get to know them by writing them. And I have to write my way into a story and figure out what the relationships are like. And then I feel like the plot almost forms as those character arcs are forming as well and everything kind of is working together. But when I begin, I usually begin with a character and I see character before plot. And I usually see, I, I write first person and it's usually the narrator who I see first. And this was not the case in this book. The first character that I kind of felt like I knew was Ruby. Um, and she's the character who comes home after being convicted and kind of shakes everything up. And kind of instinctively, I thought, well, this this feels like Ruby's story, but also Ruby knows whether she did it or not. And I really wanted to kind of have that perspective of somebody who didn't know. And, and you're sort of seeing this entire cast of characters as suspects, that anyone had a motive, anyone could have done it. So I started with the idea of Ruby, who's the type of character who would choose to come back to this place that had convicted her? Um, you know, I, I feel like if it were me, I would be like, I'm never going back there, but she does, she goes back and you kind of wonder why is she there? And so I knew I wanted to tell the story from her roommate's perspective. And I feel like that dynamic really kind of set the tone for the book. Um, they're very different characters. Harper has always seen Ruby sort of like a, a younger sister, somebody she's looked after, but Harper has always been the more stable personality. I feel like she's not the one who would have been like, guys, we're going to solve a murder and I'm going to lead the charge. But she's put in the position where she really has to become that character. And when I was kind of forming like this, this street of suspects, um, I was really interested in this idea of this close-knit neighborhood. And one of the things that's unique about it is it's not only people who live together and you kind of see that layer of one another, they also mostly all work together. So it's set in a college town and there's not other industries in the area. So pretty much everyone there either works for the college in some way or one of the surrounding school systems. And they're all kind of home for the summer. And I was really interested in this idea of things from work following you home and vice versa, that this place that was so idyllic and seemed the perfect place to live suddenly also becomes inescapable because rumors from school follow you home. You couldn't just come home and kind of like shake that off and, and, you know, see your people who know you a different way. It was like, they were just so entrenched in one another's lives, but that also helped me develop the cast because I was thinking, okay, so what kind of roles 
can people have in a school? And so we have people who work in admissions and people who are professors, but also people who work in healthcare and security. And it kind of gave a different role to everyone in the neighborhood as well. So it was kind of fun to develop the characters along those lines. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, these both of these scenarios, they're just so close knit. Um, and Megan, I just I loved Harper. I loved, you know, hearing her perspective because we're, we're, you know, on this journey, this it, this mystery with her throughout the book. And so we're we're kind of in her head and we're hearing all of her thought thought processes and trying to solve this mystery right along with Harper. And Ruby is such a bold, interesting character. I mean, the first scene, and I'm not going to spoil anything, but when she makes her return, I was like, ah, you know, what is happening? And, you know, trying to feel what Harper would feel in that moment. Um, so I just, I think that you captured these characters so phenomenally. Um, and so so again, you know, for all of you out there, if you've read it or haven't read it yet, or you're looking forward to reading it, just these characters are just so great to, to um, just kind of lose yourself in and, and hear their story. Um, the setting was another thing about both of these books that, that really captured me. And again, this is another place that I thought they were, they were quite similar and that both of the communities that you're describing are not places that you would expect some murder to happen. And I feel like you can see it like right on the cover of these books yeah. they're just like these you know, <laughs> beautiful home over here this picturesque community on on Megan's cover you know these are middle upper class neighborhoods and they are just so idyllic and um peaceful communities and, and not a place that you would expect a murder so um so talk a little bit about that Megan you know what what made you want to set this this mystery this murder in such a peaceful community yeah, so I, I love like how both of our covers and themes do, I feel like they both pull on that element a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's something, it's a theme I'm just fascinated in. I feel like I love small town settings in general. And I've always, all of my adult suspense are set in these small towns. And I'd been interested in a, for a long time about pulling those boundaries even tighter and seeing if I could just set like a mystery or a thriller within a neighborhood and how technology somewhat makes that possible if you're seeing everyone who comes in and out and suddenly you get this sort of locked box. Um, and I also feel like I'm always setting books near woods or water. And I feel like this is like an aspirational thing for me because I just love being near both. And so in this case, I set it near both. Like it, there's, it's a neighborhood, you're in suburbia, but you cross the street and suddenly you're in the woods and you're right on the lake. And I feel like there's just so much you could do with that type of setting where it is an idyllic place. Everyone wants to live. They feel like they have the best of both worlds. Um, but it's also that kind of, I love playing with that boundary of like, suburbia and then also what can be hidden just under the surface you cross the street you're in the woods you're in the lake the there's a drought and the water starts to recede and suddenly what's coming back to the surface so I just feel like there's just so much you can do with those types of settings but this was I mean it was my first time kind of writing a a locked box type mystery which which felt like a different sort of challenge um and I just I I really enjoyed that aspect of it but I think in any sort of suspense story, you're kind of peeling back the layers of, of, of a community or a setting and, and kind of seeing, well, this is what it looks like, but what are the secrets hidden underneath? And that's sort of what happens in this community. You're seeing kind of the, the facade on the surface and then something happens to shake that up and you're, you're peeling back the layers of all the things hidden underneath, which I think is, is just something I'm really drawn to in all of my books. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the the lake and the woods, they just add so much atmosphere and so much tension. You know, there are a couple of scenes that take place within the woods and, and, oh, I was scared. You know, you don't know what's, what's out there that you can't see and what's happening. And um, you also in your book here, I absolutely love this. There's a map. Yes. Um, and I know that this, you could probably can't see it really well, but I had, I listened to the book. So I, I didn't know that there was a map. And then um, I don't know, I don't know if it was a review or something or, or someone else who had read the book mentioned the map. And so I went and I looked and, and found it. And I was so excited because um, it's just so, it's so cool to be able to see it, you know, visually there and be like, oh, you know, that's where so-and-so lives and to really have that visual of it. So I have to ask, was the map your idea? 
So I have, I love this map story because it, it was, and it wasn't. So when I turned to my first draft, my editor said, I feel like you drew a map to this because so much of the story has to do with who is seeing which piece of evidence. And one of the first scenes is Ruby walking down the street and saying, you know, Harper saying that neighborhood, that house had that piece, that house saw that. And I said, oh yes, I have a map. And she said, well, we'd love to incorporate that if we can, like, let's think about how to do it. So when I sat down to do my second draft, in my mind, I had that this was sort of the piece of evidence that the cop who lived in the neighborhood would have sort of presented to sh in the trial to show this is where everybody lives and this is their piece of evidence. So it became kind of an organic piece of the story. Um, and I, so they were like, we'd love to see your map. Like, can, can you send it to us? I was like, yes, it's not good. And they're like, no, no, that's fine. But it was like the size of the sticky note. Like it was like, you know, circles for houses and like a line that said road and trees. And they turned it into this amazing, like that's to me what Hollow's Edge looks like. Yeah, I love it. I love it. It's so if, if you're somebody like me who's listening to the book, make sure that you you get a physical copy or look at a physical copy and see the map because I loved it. It was just, it was great. It was, it was really helpful and it just really helped me to place where everything was. So, um, so I love that. And Sherry, Breck and Hill, tell me a little bit about, about it. I mean, it is this, it's, it's a very upper class neighborhood um and so why did you decide to set this this murder in in this neighborhood and is it based on any real place or is it completely fictional it's not it's not based on any real place i i wanted to make these very very wealthy people so i invented a, a, an enclave that's sort of like rosedale in toronto where it's but it's not rosedale in toronto it's just like that where um they have million million dollar homes and it's all very beautiful and very um, set back. So there's a lot of privacy and um, very sort of elitist. And I wanted to have that sort of family that was very wealthy and very private, like that old wasp family that was very, didn't want anyone knowing their business um, because this family has a lot of secrets to hide. And uh, I liked what Megan said about the facade because I think you and I are both very similar in how we look at things, right? And um, yeah, it's about the facade of, oh, this beautiful, oh, wealthy, wealthy neighborhood and everyone has a beautiful home and a beautiful life and my beautiful children. But, it, you know, you rip it away and it's like, oh, it's just a viper's nest of horribleness. And um, so it's, it's, it's a similar thing. It's not a closed, um, uh, closed room mystery, so to speak, in the same way that maybe Miranda's is, but it's... Um, it's a family story. It's an extended family story. And there's a lot of collateral damage with the spouses of the kids. And um, so it's a close knit family. Um, well, I shouldn't say they're close knit, but it's a family <laughs> and they're all connected. <laughs> and yeah, it's, and it's, it's all very, um, very complicated and not happy. And, um, and I love to dig underneath that and and see how people really feel like I like to see how the parents really felt about their kids and you know they weren't very happy with them and right or wrong they they were very disappointed in their children and so there's a there's a whole angle of you know how much do parents really get to determine who their kids are like they shouldn't be determining who their kids are and their kids resent it resent them for it and yet the kids have expectations of inheriting a ton of money and the, the father starts to say, you've disappointed me. You're not going to get this money. And then they feel angry and entitled. And um, yeah, it's all very, um, it's about expectations and having those expectations um, disrupted. And both on, on both sides, like the parents, you know, they have a daughter who's like a wild bohemian artist who's very, you know, promiscuous and takes drugs and they're not very happy with her. And they have a son who's, hasn't really performed as well running the family business as, as the dad expected. He's not the, the brilliant businessman the father is. And so the father sells the company up from under him so that he has nothing. And um, the eldest daughter is, is the favorite, but she's very conservative and does everything her parents wish. But uh, she's a dermatologist rather than a famous cardiac surgeon. So, that, you know, they're disappointed in all of them. And yet they've been such terrible parents. <laughs> they have a lot of nerve being disappointed. But um, anyway, it's all very toxic. And um, yeah, I like to look behind closed doors and see 
what's really going on with those intimate relationships. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of dysfunction and yes. and in resentment, even behind the most beautiful facade. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's very sometimes the most beautiful. So this is a line where I think one of the detectives goes to the house where they're finding the bodies and they've been you know, murdered in a horrible way. And she says, sometimes having money isn't a good thing. And um, and I wrote that and I thought, yeah, like maybe that's <laughs> Yeah, because at that point they think maybe it's a break and enter, maybe they've been robbed or whatever. So, um, but you know, having a lot of money maybe didn't do this family any particular favors. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, technology comes into play in both of the books too. Um, things like ring doorbells and um, and Megan in yours, there's a neighborhood community page that that people are pretty active on. Um, I know I have a Facebook page, a neighborhood Facebook page in, in my my neighborhood, and I mean I love going on there for information, but more so for gossip. And you know, so I feel like these are real things that that we're in the last you know decade or five years maybe really encountering. And, and the ring doorbells that can just pick up, you know, any activity that's going on on, on the street with this technology um, that you both brought into your novels, you know, how much how much more difficult does it make it to try and pull off a fictional murder when, you know, somebody's kind of always watching? Um, Sherry, do you want to tackle that first? I think it's a lot harder. I don't know <laughs> about you, Megan, but I think the modern world, the technology, it's... Um, it makes it much harder than back in the Agatha Christie day to pull off a murder because the same with your book and mine. Uh, some of my people are caught by porch cams, seeing the car leave and, you know, showing that their alibis are rubbish. So, um, you know, on the one hand, it, it, you know, and cell phones that can track everywhere you are, it's so much harder to write a good murder mystery, <laughs> I swear. However, if you embrace it, you can use the technology in interesting ways to help you in your book, but it is more complicated. Like this camera, you know, the CCTV and the and the um, all the forensics they have now, it's it is harder to pull off a murder. You know, it's it's like I, sometimes I think, well, why didn't they catch them right away? And quite often it's just the you know police error or they don't have the funding to do the tests that they need to do, or they're over, you know, they don't have enough staff to look at things properly or whatever but you would think science being what it is that they could always catch every murderer you know yeah. but they don't yeah. and it's, I think it's just um modern like um scarcity of resources really that that so you know sometimes you just have to rely on the well the police didn't run that test because they didn't have the funds um because I I you know I feel that technology does make writing a murder story harder However, it is kind of cool to do some of the things that we can do now with um, this technology. But the technology keeps changing, so you have to keep up on it, right? Um, which makes it really challenging for an older uh, mystery author, you know, to to really um, keep working on things like that. But I don't know how Megan, how you feel about it. I mean, it it does provide nice opportunities with the porch cams and so on. Um, but if you're trying to plan the perfect murder, oh my God, I wouldn't do it now. Like I, I think in the fifties, you could have gotten away with murder, but I, I don't know why anyone even tries it on anymore. Well, right, it seems like it would be so much easier, you know, 50 years ago. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> what about you, Megan? How, how much more difficult did that make it for you? I feel exactly the same as Sherry. I feel like, I think about when I was writing this book too, I thought about how different even solving crimes from 10 or 20 years ago would have been like, how are these, yeah. how are these solved differently if everyone had a doorbell camera or a security footage in their neighborhood? And also then how do criminals act differently knowing those things are there as well? Um, but I remember like writing my first book, which was a young adult and it was, um, it's like 10 years ago and how different it was just 10 years ago where like maybe there was a cell phone maybe there wasn't but it didn't have to be like a major player and then like you know I, I I feel like I set my books in like mountainous areas and you can be like dead zone you know okay so there's no I've tried that on too yeah, yeah no cell reception here yeah. right because I feel like otherwise the question is like, why don't you call 911 right there? Why don't you Google that right, you know, where you are? And so it is sort of, you're constantly kind of like trying to answer those questions that suddenly technology can provide. And I felt like, kind of like you were saying, Shari, this is 
one time where suddenly I felt like embracing the technology and kind of seeing there's other things you can do with it because technology is not infallible either. And, and you're sort yeah. of seeing, okay, so technology shows us these things, but is it accurate? Is it a perspective? Is it showing a snippet in time that can be perceived in many different ways? Um, yeah. And can it be turned against you? Yeah. Technology can be deleted. Like how can things then be used that you think are for like the common good or were used, like they were put in place for, for reasons that seemed positive suddenly turn negative and, and be used in, in different ways. So I feel like there are ways to use that technology um, as well. And so I feel like this book was maybe the first time I was kind of exploring that where in general, I'd, I'd kind of, in my other books were more trying to avoid <laughs> those angles. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this was more of an embracing it and seeing, well, you know, just because it's there doesn't mean it's solving it. It, it can be creating more issues. Right. And yeah, I mean, I think you do have to acknowledge it now. And if, if you do finesse it, you have to sort of say, oh, I'm out of range or right. um, you can't just pretend it's not there. Um, or you get all kinds of letters. Yes. It's it's totally true. And uh, um, the technology, you can use it in a like somewhat misleading way too, because some of the things that, for example, you're picking up on the doorbell cameras, you know, you your people are are left to like judge, you know, what they think they're seeing and what they think is happening, but we don't know if that's entirely accurate, if there's more to it than meets the eye. So there's still, you know, a lot left for the reader to try and decide. And I love the way that you both embrace technology because I too am of the mindset, like, let's just try and avoid it as much as we can because it makes it too too difficult to try and pull these murders off. So I love that you've actually just embraced it and incorporated it in your novels and made it work. Um, okay, so covers, again, I know I, I showed these beautiful covers and Megan's got hers there behind her, but I wanted to talk a little bit about um, cover art and titles for your books. So um, I know that it varies by publisher, really, um, you know, how it works for cover design, if you see one or, or how involved you are in the process. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about, was this the first cover you saw? Did you see multiple covers before this one? How involved are you in that process? And kind of the same with the title. Was this a working title that you had for the book or has it gone through many different variations? Um, Megan, you wanna start with that one? Yeah, so I first, I feel like I have to confess that usually like I will turn in books that just say like draft, like book four, because I know my titles are usually not going to, to make it through. I usually come up with a title very early on that feels more thematic than like, and so titles for me are, are like a, a constant conversation. Although this one, I feel like we got to pretty early on. So when I started writing the book, I had called it Hollow's Edge, which was what the neighborhood was. And I knew that wasn't really going to stick. And I remember I was talking to my editor about the book and kind of picked out a line in the book that I said, oh, there's a line where they said, oh, it was such a quiet neighborhood. And she goes, oh, I feel like that's, that's the direction. And so at first we called it such a quiet neighborhood. Um, and then quickly it evolved to, okay, such a quiet street, such a quiet place. And so we did have such a quiet place when we were looking at the cover designs and they sent me several um, concepts and this was one of them. And I think we all knew immediately like, yes, like we all were like, that's the one, that's right. I love how it feels like you're seeing everything because it's this aerial view, but actually you're seeing nothing. Um, you, and so I just felt like atmospherically, it fit perfectly. The cover department at Simon & Schuster, I feel like they just nail it every time. And I'm not someone who's a very visual person who can give the ideas beforehand, but um, they send it to me and I'm like, yep, that's it. Like that's, that's the right cover. It's perfect for the book. So I've been very fortunate with the covers for these books. Yeah, I, I love it. I mean, the colors, you just, you have to be totally drawn to the covers the minute you lay eyes on this book. And like you said, you're seeing something without really seeing something. Yeah. Um, and just, I mean, it, it's so beautiful and idyllic, but you know that there's more going on beneath that. And I love, I love the title. And I, I love that moment when you're reading a book and you come across, you know, the, the title in there, or you know, you know what inspired the title. And so that was a moment that I had when I was listening to your book. And I, I 
just, it just jumped out to me and I was like, oh, that's so perfect. So I love it. Um, Sherry, what about you? How did, how did um, the title and, and the cover artwork kind of transpire? Um, I, I find titles very, very difficult. Um, it's usually my team that figures out the title. And I, I think the hardest thing about titles is I can come up with great titles, but they're all taken. So every great thriller title I think of has been recently used by somebody. So that is, I think, the real challenge of coming up with a good thriller title. Um, so I, you know, sometimes I, I came up with a couple next door. You know, sometimes my agent comes up with the title. Sometimes my editor comes up with the title. Sometimes the head of the company comes up with it, the title. It's something we talk about for a long time. Um, and we usually go through quite a few. Um, the cover is a little easier. They've got a fabulous um, cover art uh, department or whatever. And I believe this one for the US cover was the first one they showed us and we all loved it right off. There's something about the really hot, bright colors and the there's sort of the shadows of people in the house. You can't really see them here, but there's like, you can see people in the, in the house and it's a mansion and, um, yeah, I, I love this this right away and the colors really pop. And um, so the, the title and the cover always have to work together, of course. And I'm just really happy that I have people that can do it. Because like you, Miranda, I am not a visual person. I never have a suggestion. I like, I don't know, like a dead body. Like I have no <laughs> clue what should go on the cover. And, um, and I, I come up with, like I said, I come up with great titles, I think, and they're always taken. I Google them immediately, like, oh, that was done or that was done. So I think um, I'm lucky I have people that can help me with that. And I also find interesting is that British covers are always very different from American covers. And they always come with great covers too, but they're cover specific to that market and they're quite different. Um, but I, I, find, I always find it fascinating how different cultures like different kinds of covers different um, like looks and feelings and stuff. But yours, uh, Megan, is very suggestive, which I think is what you want in a thriller title. It's very, it's, it's like not telling you anything, but it's making you want to know. So that's what you want in a thriller title. And I'm thinking mine kind of does that too. Yeah, I think that they both do. I think they do. You know, you know that there is something more going yes. out so that you can't see whether it's in this neighborhood or in this home and you're just you're dying to get in there and find out what it is so and they also I have to say look so good on a bookshelf together I mean they they, don't they they kind of go <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, so I'm actually going to take a quick step back and I know what Megan, you were a scientist and a science teacher, right? A, a high school teacher before turning to writing and Sherry, you were a lawyer and an English teacher. Is that correct? That's right. So did you, did you always love to write or is it, is it something that you started doing, you know, during your teaching career or, or, or how did that come to be? Um, Sherry? Well, aren't you glad you're not teaching during COVID? Like, <laughs> I'm so glad I'm not teaching during COVID. Um, well, for me, um, I always wanted to be a writer, but I never did any writing until I went through being a lawyer and I became a teacher. And then I stayed home with my first child. And that's when I actually started seriously writing. I, I dabbled a little bit, but not much. And then when I was home with my kids, I thought, right, I, I have a year. I'm going to give it a good go, see if I can write a novel. And I, um, I did. I wrote a novel in a year and it was a, a literary novel, not one of my thrillers. And um, and then I wrote another one, and, and those did those did okay. And then, but I really wanted to write a thriller, and I switched over to thrillers. So, when I was a kid, it's really interesting to me. When I was about nine, I knew I wanted to be an author, and I wanted to write Nancy Drew books, and then I wanted to write Agatha Christie books, and I just wanted to write mysteries and horse books, and that's what I wanted to do. And of course, I grew up and I became a lawyer and all that stuff. But here I am writing mysteries. Isn't that funny? I mean, it's just so odd. I started off in literary fiction. I went all, I went all these detours, you know, law school, teacher's college, you know, literary fiction. And here I am right back where I wanted to be at nine where I'm writing <laughs> mysteries that I find really fun and I love to read. So you knew um, what you were to do from an early did, age. Yeah. So I tell my kids, what did you really love to do at nine? That's probably what you should be doing. <laughs> so, I mean, I think if you really want to be a writer, you find your way to it eventually. Um, and I think people who love writing just love to write, whether they're published or not. And I think we all start off writing lots with never being published or not even having an expectation of being published. So 
you know, that's just, I think how we all, how we all start off. Yeah. Well, your, your fans are so grateful for your books and your writing and gosh, you're just phenomenal work, Sherry. Um, what about I'm you? grateful because it's a great, it's a great life being an author. I mean, um, I don't have to go to work like in an office. I have, you know, it's, there's so much freedom really to being an author. It's, you, you get your creative life and you get your, you're in control of your time. And I, you know, I don't like being an employee. I'm, I'm just not a good employee. I, I, I just like being my own, I like doing my own thing. And, um, and I think a lot of writers sort of feel that way. Um, and it's nice to have a creative outlet. I found, you know, when as a lawyer, I was really struggling with not having a creative outlet. Right. Well, and especially if it was something that had interest you since such a young mm -hmm. age, you know, it sounds like it was something that you were really destined to do. So mm -hmm. that would have been difficult mm -hmm. to, you know, have that kind of um, desire and, and um, just that inspiration inside of you and not really be able to do it. So mm -hmm. um, I think it's fantastic that you're able to do this. And, and I agree with you. There is a lot of freedom in writing, you know, to not, yeah. um, to not have a, a desk job or go to an office every day. And, um, yeah. I, I'm grateful for that as well. I mean, we work very, very hard. All of us work very, very hard. I mean, we work probably just as hard as anybody working in an office, but it's just, we have more control over what we do, which I, I like. If you're a 5 a.m. writer like myself, you can do that. <laughs> if you're a midnight writer, you can do that. <laughs> I'm a 9 a.m. writer. I, that's very reasonable <laughs> to me. I'm not a 5 a.m. or a midnight. <laughs> Megan, what about you? Very similar. And I also, I love that all three of us had backgrounds in teaching as well before we were writers. Um, you were a teacher, Mary? I, didn't I, know was, that. I was a high school history teacher. Oh, <laughs> high school English. High school science. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I love this. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Practically. <laughs> huh. But I, I have a very similar story, honestly. Like I grew up loving to read and write. I, I love Nancy Drew. My mom was a huge mystery reader and that's what was on my shelves growing up. And I just devoured them. And I loved the puzzles of mysteries. And I always said, I want to be a writer. And I wrote through school and I also loved science. Um, and I went to, I decided to take the track um, to go to college for science because um, I kind of knew that career path, but I always hoped to write on the side. And the truth is I gave it up for a while. I, I said I was busy with school and then I was busy with my job and then I had kids of my own. And that was when I, I sort of was like, this is my dream. What I said, I always want to do. I kind of, you know, there's really no right time for it. Like if this is what you love to do, take a real shot at it. And so I set myself the goal of, of finishing something. And I mean, it was not great, but it proved to myself that I could kind of reach the end. Um, and, and I was kind of hooked after that. I, I was writing every night when my kids were asleep. Um, and I sent that first draft out to agents, which was soundly rejected, but I got a lot of feedback um, on that story and people who said they were interested in seeing it again. Um, and so I rewrote that book twice from scratch and it did ultimately become my first published novel. Um, the only thing that's the same is like the title and the main character's name in like a couple of sentences. Um, but it, I feel like, you know, my first books were, were young adult. They were set in the world of high school and they had this science angle to them. So I feel like all of that life experience kind of Mm -hmm. provided that inspiration of the stories I was then telling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was like this merging of worlds, you yeah. know? Yeah. That's so great. Yeah. Well, I love, I mean, I love both of those stories, you know, I love when it's one of those things that you just love to do, you know, and it's, it's hard. It's kind of a leap of faith. I think, you know, writing that novel and taking the time and not knowing what's going to happen and um, just putting, you know, your heart and your soul into it and never knowing if anything's going to become of it. So, but I mean, both of you, I mean, you're huge successes and your, your books are just so phenomenal. So I'm so glad that, that you did that and that you wrote those first books and that you continue to write and produce just incredible, incredible novels. Um, well, Megan said something that I think is really important. It's that when you're starting out to write, it's so important just to finish a novel because there's so much to be learned from finishing it. Like anybody can sort of write something and peter out, but boy, when you finish a novel and see what's wrong with it as a structure, that's when you actually learn something. So anybody out there wanting to write, it's really important that you actually 
go to the end and finish the darn thing because that's how you learn you know yeah if you don't finish it then you're not really learning that much yeah, no, I completely agree. And it's just so motivating, I think, to actually get to the ends because that's it doesn't happen quickly. You know, it takes a long time. It's a marathon. Um, so my last question for you too, before we open it up to the questions is just about libraries. We're here being hosted by a number of Chicago area libraries today. And I know libraries have always been incredibly important in my life from the time I was a little girl and would go to the library and check out books to you know, being a teacher, a writer, um, a mother and taking my own kids to the library. So can you just talk for a minute about the impact of libraries in your own lives? Same, same. I mean, libraries were huge to me. I think all kid work, bookworms feel the same about the libraries because their parents aren't going to buy them 15 books a week. So um, I still remember my first library card. It was yellow. It was a little like cardboard yellow thing. And I was so excited when I got it. And um, I remember when I was about, I don't know, six or seven, I was allowed to go to the library by myself on Saturday mornings. Um, and, you know, you would never allow a kid to go alone now to the library, like without their parent. But back when I was a kid, it was done all the time. So I had to walk across the, there was a fire station on the way to the library. And every week I, I would like, I would get to the point where the fire station was, I was so afraid that the fire alarms would come and they'd come out when I was walking across the pavement and they would come out and hit me with the fire trucks. So I'd always get really nervous, but I would like run across the fire station to get to the library because I really wanted my books. And I don't know why I was so stupid. I didn't think to cross the street and go down the other sidewalk. I just <laughs> pushed myself through. So yeah, every week it was this, this like fear, you know, I got to get past the fire station to get to my library books, but um, I did it. And um, yeah, libraries are huge. I'm a big supporter of the library here in Toronto. And to be honest, the libraries were a big help to me when I started out because I used the writer and residence program to help me um, become a published author. So um, yeah, I'm a huge fan of libraries. I think, I think they're so important. Yeah. Yeah, I very similar. I mean, I, I, my mom, like I said, was a huge mystery reader. And I remember that every week, so she, she had off on Thursdays and that was the day that she would take me to the library every Thursday. And she would just kind of let me loose and just, you know, find the books you love. And I would come out with those stacks of books every week. And I feel like that's how I also discovered the types of books I love to read and, and just, the, the questions that I had and I like, it's been so important to me as like my development as a reader, but also as just a writer and just like a person in general. Like I, I like you were saying, Mary, I continued this with my own kids. Um, yeah, me too. You know, when my kids were little, we would go to the library each week and they had their story times. And I remember when we were moving, we're in the process of moving. Um, and so I was writing one of my books in like a cubby of that library um, as well for a time. And I just, you know, libraries have been so instrumental at kind of every phase of my life and so grateful um, for them and huge supporter and so grateful for their support as well. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. Just such a wonderful community feel that you get at a library that you just really can't get anywhere else. So thank you to all the libraries that are hosting us tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you, ladies. That was an awesome conversation. Um, it's so great to see the three of you together, and uh, we appreciate your kind words about libraries. We also think libraries are very important. Um, quickly, for all of my attendees here tonight, before we get to the Q&A, um, there's just going to be a quick little poll. It's going to pop up in your Zoom client. It should be up there now. We simply want to find out how many people are joining us tonight. And then after you answer that question, there's going to be a couple of fun questions that pop up for you. Don't worry, we're not going to give your answers out to everybody. So if you don't know the answers to the fun questions, that's okay. All right, thank you all. So before we get to the Q&A, also, while you guys are answering this poll, um, I just want to mention that this event is being recorded and you will be able to access the recording on one of the participating libraries YouTube channels, hopefully within the next week. Um, and also you'll be receiving a follow up email um, from zoom that will include information on the recording as well so don't worry. Um, if you wanted to watch again or you wanted to share with your family and friends you'll certainly get the opportunity. 
All right, we're going to cruise right along and I'm going to start um, asking some questions while you guys finish up your poll. So our first question is, how did the pandemic impact your writing and will it be present in any of your future works? Well, I'll just quickly say I found it harder during the pandemic to work initially. I, I eventually got back into my group, but I found it difficult having everyone at home and not having my usual quiet place. And I was very distracted by the news. Um, and um, as far as the pandemic goes in future books, like I deliberately set Not a Happy Family right before the pandemic so that I wouldn't have to deal with it. Um, in future though, if it goes on for two or three years, I think it's gonna be hard to set a book that doesn't acknowledge it in some way. Um, whether people are just wearing masks to the passing or what, it's gonna be hard to just not acknowledge it, but I'm certainly not gonna write a pandemic book about the pandemic. I'm sick to death of the whole pandemic. <laughs> Yeah, um, I similar answer. I had a really hard time kind of getting into that headspace, that creative headspace with everything that was going on um, in the world and, and seeing the news. And I came up with the idea for such a quiet place beforehand, but I wrote most of it during. Um, and so there was a time in the spring where I just wasn't really able to, to access that creative part um and then i think I, I became a writer more like mary in the summer i went to like my 5 a.m writing before everyone else was up which is not what my normal routine was like but kind of finding that the new routines that kind of work during that time and very much like sherry i purposely set such a quiet place in 2019 um before the pandemic because you know you're enduring it you're not really sure like where it's going, it, it was very hard to write it at that time and, and kind of know what the future held. Um, and then I wrote another book during the pandemic, which comes out next year. And I set that one in 2022. So there are definite references to it, but um, in the book, it's it's not really a, a factor. Um, so yeah, but like you were saying, it's it, I guess it depends what happens in the future, um, how we mm -hmm. kind of address that in the book, but I'm not setting something deliberately in like that 2020, 2021 pandemic time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm personally, I'm not ready to read a book about um, set during pandemic times. We're kind of still living them. So that's good enough for me. Um, our next question, if you could travel back in time, what would you go back and tell your earlier writing self now that you are an accomplished and successful mystery author? That's a good question. I think I would just say, you know, to keep going. And, and this was, uh, you know, advice somebody had given me very early on was, you know, to, to just write the next book and, and focus on that next book. And um, that's something I've really taken to heart. Like I, I love the story when I live within it and then to, to, you know, always be thinking about that next idea. And I really think that so much is just, you know, you, I feel like I become a better writer with every book, or at least I hope I do. And I learn so much with each book. And, and that's, I guess, the, the advice I would give myself back then. And also what I would tell them, like, you, you get there, you know, each book gets you a step closer to, to where you want to be. pretty sure the one thing I would tell myself was start earlier and stop putting it off because I didn't start writing at all until I was 40 and um, I didn't write my first thriller until I was in my mid-50s so I regret not starting much younger but I put it off and I thought you know I'm not really a writer and I'm not really a wannabe but I'm not really like I'm one of these secret underconfident writers and I didn't want anyone to know what I was doing and um, I wish I'd started much younger to be honest, instead of going off in all sorts of other directions. I should have listened to my gut. But, you know, it's all turned out well enough. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying if I could talk to my younger self, I would say, you know, get on it. Okay. And how did both of you decide to write whodunits? And have you written any other kind of fiction or any nonfiction? I um, I've told this story a lot, but I um, always love to read mysteries and, and thrillers. Um, that's what I grew up reading, and that's what I love to read. But I started off writing literary fiction, so I um, and I did that because 
it doesn't really require a plot. And I thought, I, when I started writing, I just started with an idea and I just sort of um, meandered along and, and didn't really have any idea where it was going. And I wrote a couple of books that way and they actually did have plots. And then I thought, I've always wanted to write a thriller. That's what I'd like to do, but I thought I couldn't do it because I didn't know how to plot. Um, so I thought, you know, I, I would write, try to write a thriller in secret, not tell anybody. So that when I couldn't do it, nobody would know. So I, that's how I started Couple Next Door. And I, I've told this story many times. I never told my husband what I was doing. He thought I was working on another literary book. Um, but yeah, I sat down in secret and I wrote The Couple Next Door in six months. And I sent it off to an agent and, you know, changed my life. So then I, I realized that I really could write a thriller without outlining it first. And I'd always thought that thriller writers had to plan their elaborate plots beforehand. And that's simply not the case. So. I wish I'd known that 15 years earlier, um, but hey, you know, better late than never, but yeah. Yeah, I um, I started writing young adult, but um, they were also suspense and mysteries. I, I've just always kind of been drawn to those types of stories. And and I'm looking in hindsight, I, I did wonder a little because people would ask me this, like what, what drew you to these types of stories? And I was also a kid who was afraid of like everything. So why was I the kid also reading in the dark, like these really creepy stories? But I think um, for me, I see it more like you're, you're following a character through something and you're making it out the other side. Um, we're kind of, you know, and un you're finding an understanding of what happened. And that's what I'm really drawn to within these mystery and suspense stories. I love the puzzle aspect of it, but I love like kind of unraveling the mysteries inside people and, and following a character through a journey. And that's what really draws me to this type of story. But anytime I, I would think earlier on in my career, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try a little bit something different, like something, tragic happen like there's like a dead body showing up on page 10 and I'm like oh that's there right you go. <laughs> I'm writing a mystery I'm writing a suspense again so I feel like I'm just always kind of drawn to that structure and and how it puts everything under such pressure where I feel like it's just so revealing of character like you you don't have time to make like to think things through it's like what's your split second decision and and what does that reveal about people so maybe you can say it was kind of a, it was fate that you guys ended up writing those. That's yes. awesome. All right. Uh, another good question. Is there a certain author you like reading? Who's your favorite author? Well, present company excluded because I love both Mary and Sherry's books. I'm, I'm a huge reader of all kind of psychological suspense, character driven suspense. I'm a huge fan of it all. Um, Tana French is one that I, I like save her books for like a bribe for myself for when I finish a draft. I just, I find her writing exquisite and I feel like every plot is perfectly suited for the character that's going through it. So she's one of my favorites um, always. That's such a hard question. Um, so many, so many were formative for me. You know, Agatha Christie and Patricia Highsmith together the plots and the psychology and the darkness those two I think were really formative for me um currently though like I have to go back to Kate Atkinson's um the, A God in Ruins that book it's such a like it's a suspense novel right there's so many moments in that you know when she there are just so many good domestic suspense moments in that book um that I just it blows me away how she can, how she can do what she does. I think she's a marvel. I really do. I wish I could talk about it, because, but I don't want to do any spoilers. But there's a couple of moments where someone almost kills someone, and and you know the tension in that scene is is um, anyway. I can't. But uh, yeah, I'm a big admirer of hers. I'll have to read it to find out. <laughs> other one that I really admire. Very cool. Well, we do have time for one last question, and this is kind of a fun one. Um, I, I know I've asked Mary this in the past. Um, how are the bookshelves behind you organized, Sherry? Well, they're a bit of a mess. Um, I have half my books here and half at my farm. Um, they're in, oh, I think I know they're in no particular order because I can see no, they're not in any particular order. I have not alphabetized them. I The ones that I moved up to my farm are in alphabetical order by genre. So I have my 
history ones. And I have my thriller. My thriller section is much bigger than my other sections. And it's alphabetized at my new place. But at my old place, they're just all, you know, all over the place. OK. Well, we've kind of, we've, we've definitely hit our time limit here. Um, but you guys had such a great conversation. And we have a lot of curious, um, curious attendees here and lots of mystery readers, it turns out. You guys have so many great questions. I'm sorry we don't have time to get to them all. Um, but I do want to thank Megan, Sherry, and Mary um, for joining us here tonight and all of our partner libraries. And thank yes, you. we wanted to thank you guys for the great evening and the great conversation, the great questions, the great answers. Um, before we say good night, we're going to throw up the poll results that you all took so you can see, and, and Megan and Sherry, you can let everyone know um, how everyone did. But um, just in case everyone wanted to see the poll results, here they are. And we also wanted to remind everyone that the links to purchase um, Megan and Sherry's books are in the chat box. And if you click on them, they'll, it'll take you right to the three, our three partnering bookstores, the Bookstall, Bookbin, and Barbara's Bookstore. Um, and with that, we again wanted to thank everyone. Um, so we'll say good night and thank you all for um, sharing your time with us and thank everyone for attending. Thank you for having us. Thank Mary, you. Thank you, Mary. Thank, thank you, Mary. 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 Thank you,